All right, guys. So this is gonna be uh, lecture number nineteen in the uh, traditional channel, fleeing liberalism, fascism, and Carl Schmitt. The roots of fascism, like Bolshevism, lie in the First World War. The war provoked dissatisfaction with the status quo, but also gave large numbers of rural peasants and low-wage urban workers the experience of serving a nationalist cause on equal footing with others of their nationality. Many people in the years 1900 to 1933 became convinced that liberal capitalism and parliamentary democracy were unjust and inadequate, a view that was exacerbated by a worldview economic depression starting in 1929. The Weimar Republic, the German democratic regimen between the wars, was buffeted by this disaffection on the right and left. Many accepted a socialist critique of liberal capitalism and joined socialist parties, but some turned to a nationalist version of socialism. The Rise of Fascism During the interwar years, especially in the Weimar Republic, the critic of limited government, representative institutions, and civil liberties was intense from right and left. Constitutional governments in many countries were weak, and many factions competed for power, including communist and new nationalist parties. An intellectual defense of extremism and even violence seemed attractive, even before the war. Freshman Gors Sorel, in his Reflections on Violence, had supported anarcho-syndicalism or revolutionary syndicalism. Sorel specifically approved revolutionary violence against parliamentary socialism. The new answer to the malaise of the war first took concrete shape in Italy. Benito Mussolini and his fascists took power in 1922, as he argued later in The Doctrine of Fascism, fascism is a spiritual doctrine. The individual must devote himself to a higher goal, which can only be the nation. Marxism is wrong because it is a merely economic doctrine because it is internationalist. It was clear that the international allied powers could not be trusted. Fascists endorsed the term totalitarianism. The state and commitment to it should be total. Only that would satisfy the spiritual needs of the people. The war and its aftermath convinced many socialist critics of the status quo that a nationalist rather than an internationalist form of socialism was the answer. Carl Schmitt was the most serious of the German political theories who supported Nazism. He joined the party in 1933 when Hitler became the German Chancellor, but long before then, starting in the early 1920s, he had begun to lay out the rationale for a kind of political that was incompatible with the struggling liberalism of the Weimar Republic. Schmidt presented a critique of liberal republicanism, or what he called parliamentary democracy. First of all, he pointed out that parliamentary is not, as its advocates believe, a discussion about truth. It is a negotiation over interests. He recognized that democracy and parliamentarism, or liberalism, are in conflict. Democracy is about power, and its purest form is direct democracy. Parliamentarism is about limiting power. Smith accused liberals' parliamentary government of relativism, that is, it relativizes all interests and claims. He quoted Karl Kautsky, the awareness of relative truths never gives one the courage to use force and to spill blood. The implication here is that political politics is about making an ultimate decision, declaring an absolute commitment. Liberalism pretends that politics can avoid such decisions. Smith argued that parliamentarism was, in 1923, bankrupt, destined to be superseded in one of two directions, by Marxism or by the viewpoint of Sorel and Mussolini. Marxism, he claimed, is a rationalist Enlightenment educational dictatorship. Mussolini is an irrationalist mythical approach to politics. At this point, Schmidt was, before the Nazis, a supporter of the temporary dictatorial powers of the president, not to supplant but to protect democracy. His practical goal was to increase executive power against parliament parliament, which he saw as unable to deal with Germany's problems. Foundations of Politics 
liberals tend to think of politics as a servant to economics. Parliamentarism considered the essence of politics to be law, but Smith argued that the very concept of the political is not moral, legal, social, or economic. Politics is deeper and more profound than all of this. In an interesting argument, Schmidt says sovereign is he who decides on the exception. Even proto-liberals such as Locke admitted that the executive must be permitted the power to suspend the laws if necessary for the good of the polity, particularly in an emergency. The concept of prerogative was seen in the Republican tradition as a kind of safety valve for use in occasional extreme cases, but Schmidt takes this more seriously. To alter the laws or suspend them in an extreme situation is an awesome power. Schmidt suggests that whoever decides the exception and can impose that decision on the polity is, in fact, the sovereign. Everything else is window dressing and mere discussion. For Schmidt, the limit or border of the political constituents, what politics is. What if we press the argument another inevitable step? Who gets to decide when there is an emergency? Schmidt says that two must be the sovereign. The implication is that the essence of political power is the ability to suspend normal law and declare martial law. For Schmidt, the law is not sovereign. We are not ruled by laws. We follow laws and are obligated to do so in normal social conditions. But that is not ruling. For the sovereign, the answer to who decides the exception is the precondition of the law being obligatory and being, in fact, obeyed. Schmidt is searching for foundations for everyday politics and finds them not in natural law or rational ethics, but in those ultimate decisions that initiate and maintain the state. He is also pushing the notion of the political to the point of pre- or non-rational existential decision on which all other political rationality, law, and structure are based. Rational arguments are always based in premises or presuppositions, what it gives us the truth of the presuppositions. Presumably another argument with another presupp presupposition, but what comes first? Whenever it cannot be the product of rational argument, The first presupposition can only be a non-rational decision, a pure commitment without argument. Schmidt is saying that the constitutional legal state must ultimately be based in something pre-constitutional, pre-legal, and pre-rational. In non-rational, this begins to sound a bit like religious faith, and indeed, in his essays Political Theology, Schmidt argues that modern political concepts are essentially earlier theological concepts secularized. That is, the politics of the modern sovereign state takes the place of religion in declaring the fundamental grounding and legitimation of any social form of life. What is politics? Finally, in his essay The Concept of Political, Schmidt deals with the interstate context of sovereignty. What is politics itself? It is not economics, culture, law, or society. It has its own unique character, which has something to do with power and something to do with membership in a political community. Politics, Smith claims, is a relation to a public enemy. It is based in the will to fight for one's existence. This is a real relation to a real outside power. The two communities are mutually exclusive. The question is, which will continue to exist? That is, politics. Politics is inherently dangerous because human beings are evil by which Schmidt means dangerous and dynamic. They are not pacific or law-governed without a willingness to fight, there is no politics. Failing to recognize the true nature of politics, liberal internationalists, parliamentarians, who try to decide all questions by law, try to defang and tame politics, but in so doing expose the state to the dangers of factions, such as Bolsheviks and fascists. Schmidt is literally arguing that liberal republicanism is not a political doctrine or view. It is a negation of politics, an attempt to replace politics itself with law, morality, or economics. In fact, Schmidt argues that liberal parliamentarisms are more brutal and exclusive without admitting or recognizing the fact 
because they regard themselves as representing moral, legal humanism. Liberal societies regard their enemies as anti-human to be treated as enemies of all mankind. Schmidt is one of the, a short list of 20th century political philosophers obsessed with the deep issue of what grounds or validity politics itself given the rejection of any natural law tradition. In effect, what justifies it is something like Nietzsche's will to power. Schmidt goes outside the modern tradition that has been based itself in finding ways to limit the political, to yoke the political to the service of society in definite ways. He wants to release the political. The political is the power to create or change society. The appeal of fascism. The combination of constitutional republicanism with regular submission of party officials to free elections, government limited by and subjected to the rule of law, a largely free market economy, and broad civic freedoms of individuals and civil society, associations make liberal republicanism appear weak and ineffectual. Theoretical, theoretically, liberal republicanism seems groundless. The search for a ground to political life leads to power, existential decision, and a theology of the nation state that is unlimited. This is, some, this is to some extent Hobbesian in that all political community, political power, and law are rooted in the absolute power of the sovereign. But Hobbes did not found the sovereign on a non-rational basis. For him, the sovereign is the creation of rational, self-interested people. As sociologist Edward Shields wrote later, fascism was nationalist but not simply nationalist. Shields believed that fascism transcendentalized the nation, treated the nation as if it were a transcendent, the bind source unifying the two. This is a nice reflection of Schmidt's notion that sovereignty is a quasi-theological idea. The political community as sovereign is a theological notion of the nation-state. The martial aspect of fascism is what reminiscent of a civic republicanism, except now in a bureaucratic, non-egalitarian, and far more extreme form. As noted by Peter Drucker, the fascist response to the inadequacy of socialism or Marxism To cure capitalism's ills is to put the nationalist military life above the economic. Economics is now in service to a higher ideal. Totalitarianism, Drucker says, is a Verwirtschaft, war organization, of the business of society. This will bring a new equality of all citizens as soldiers in the national fight. We should remember that fascism and Nazism had two roots, one idealist and one realist in the political sense. The realist is easy to see. The world is made by power. All political order is based in an act of power and liberalism cannot defang the political world. But at the same time, in the demand of made own citizens, fascism and Nazism are highly idealistic. They are calls to sacrifice, to turn away from petty personal demands to the glory of the whole. Well, guys, I really hope you got like this new video and let me know what you thought about it. Uh, catch you next time.